have won all the other major competitions, I'd swap all of those goals for one Olympic bronze. Um, that's how much it, it, it means to not just me, but any Olympian. And... and I'm delighted to say that Derek Redmond joins me now. Hi, Derek. How are you doing, Mark? How are you? I'm very excited to have you. And I'm reassured <laughs> to see that you cross that set like a gazelle. <laughs> yeah, my dad's in the wings somewhere, yeah, of course. just in case. <laughs> always, always, always ready. Um, how does it feel watching that footage all these years later? I've kind of got used to it. Um, there's still a part of me. The word I think that I would use to describe that is now it's very frustrating. Um, as the years have gone by, it's mm. got a little easier to, to live with. Um, I'm more known for that than I am for all the medals uh, yeah. performances that I've, uh, that I've uh, won and, and produced over the years. Mm. Um, it's still frustrating. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about the Olympics later on, but, yeah. you know, every, every year it, it gets quite a bit of attention, but every Olympic year it seems to resurface and it comes across all my timelines on all mm. forms of um, social media and I get lots of great uh, comments from it. But it, it's, it still hurts a bit because um, with all, of all the medals that I have won... I've never won an Olympic medal, and there was a chance of winning four. Uh, mm. I think I would have won two, certainly in the relays, and mm. possibly two in, in, in the individual 400. We can't go back in time and say that de that definitely would have happened. Mm. But I didn't get the opportunity to win those medals, because the two Olympics that I competed at, I suffered pretty bad injuries at both of them. So it's still mm. a very frustrating thing to watch. It's, it's, it's odd, isn't it? And it's a sort of irony that when we watch that and my viewers at home watching, we're just consumed with pride. Yeah and consumed with admiration for you, representing yeah. the Olympic spirit and doing Britain so proud. But for you, quite the opposite, or is a kind of reminder of an unfulfilled ambition. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I get what you see and I get mm. what your viewers see and, and, and I understand that. And that gets easier to, to, mm. to, to deal with, as I say, as the years go on. But I spent, you know, many, many, many years of my life mm. training to, to hopefully win an Olympic medal. And, you know, as you said in the, you know, at the beginning of the interview, my introduction, I've, you know, I've won all the other major competitions. I'd swap all of those goals for one Olympic bronze. Um, that's how much it, it, it means to not just me, but any Olympian. And you can see that, you know, mm. the Games have just finished, you know, um, you know, earlier on today. We saw the closing ceremony. We've seen the, the reactions, the, you know, the feelings that people get win, lose or draw. You know, yes. yeah. the commitment, the dedication... Um, the sacrifices, the hard work, the ups and downs, emotionally ups and downs that all Olympians go through um, is because they really want to do their part on that stage. And for it to be taken away from you, not just by bad performance, because sometimes you can go back and say, well, I did this wrong, that didn't work, my preparations are wrong. But when it's something that you don't plan for, an injury or yeah. something like that, that it does hurt, you know, yeah. there's no two ways about it. And that, that pain etched on your face in that footage, I mean, was that physical pain from the injury or was it the emotional reaction to knowing you were out of the race? I, I think it was a bit of both. Uh, mm. It was very painful. <laughs> there's no two ways Did you feel a it. snap? What, 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 what's the manifestation? You heard a pop. So I heard a pop first. I carried on running for two or three strides because I thought it was a noise in the crowd. Oh, no. And I remember saying to myself, come on, Redmond, concentrate, because... You can hear the buzz of the crowd, but you can't hear the, an individual sort yeah. of noise or a word. Mm. And I thought it was, and then I felt the pulling of the hamstring, and it's very painful. And I grabbed the back of my leg and said, "Ouch! Oh dear! I think I've pulled my hamstring." Or words to that effect. Well, where was your dad when this happened? So my dad was sitting next to my coach. So that I was at the, I had run the first bend and halfway down the back straight. So I had run 150. If you go another 50 meters, you're at the 200 meter mark and quite high up mm. was my dad and my coach because they was getting my 200 and 300 meter splits. Mm. So sitting quite high up, they could see the 200 meter mark and the 300 meter mark. Mm. And, you know, unknown to me at the time, as I hit the deck and was in a bit of pain, my dad had his camera on his lap and he stopped watching his hand and he just said to my coach, hold this. Uh, and he started to make his way down and by the time I got, um, I got up and carried on running and got to about the 100 metre mark from the finish, uh, we kind of, um, our paths kind of crossed and there'd been some people trying to stop me um, at that, you know, from when I f first started running to the point when my old man came on yeah. and I kind of shooed them away or managed to get rid of them. Mm. And then this person came from my left-hand side and he was just, somebody was just about to, as one of my daughters used to say, get in my personal space. Yeah. Um, and, and I was just about to fend them off and my dad's got a very distinctive, deep Barry White sounding voice. <laughs> and he just said, Derek, it was me. Um, and I just turned and said, get me back into lane five. I'm going to race. And, and 
effing and jeffing and swearing, you know, and, yeah. and, and shouting, um, not at my old dad, but uh, not at my old man, but just shouting. Uh, my dad said, all right, all right, all right, we'll finish this race if, you know, if that's what you wanted to do. Because he originally came on to stop me causing any more damage to my hamstring because yeah. we still had the relay yeah. five, six days later and we didn't know whether I could get myself into shape for that. So his reasons were different to mine, but once he realised I wanted to, to finish the race, um, in his words, um, he said, um, it, you know, it wasn't the place for a, a, a family uh, disagreement, so I complied with his wishes. <laughs> it is a remarkable paternal impulse that he demonstrated. I'm sure he's been very committed to your career, you know, since, since childhood and ferrying you off to training Absolutely. and all the rest of it. So, you know, even on the biggest stage, he had your back. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's a good point you bring up. I mean, I started running when I was seven. Uh, obviously, my mum and my sister were, were there. But my dad was the person who, as you say, you pretty much started taking me to the athletics club when I was seven, standing outside, you know, at the side of a, a local track um, in my teenage years. Um, you know, when I'm training and he's there with a couple of horrible yucky coffee or tea yeah. trying to keep warm while I'm I'm training you know taking me to races uh, everything being an absolutely fantastic support all the way through my career uh, and when I broke onto the scene as a sort of an international world-class athlete my dad would always he, he worked for himself so he used to follow me around the world anyway and most people thought he was my coach and didn't realize it was my dad for many many years um, and he never coached me, but he mm. did advise me. Right. What's the difference between coaching and advice? So, I mean, a coach obviously is someone who knows the sport. They've possibly been through the sport themselves. They're the ones that sets all the training sessions, sets your race plans. So you talk with them about, you know, your race tactics. They know the sport. They're the people that look at your technique, all that sort of stuff. Time, everything, weigh you, look oh, at what you're eating. All that sort of stuff, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I had dietitians and a few other people in my team. Right. But my dad as an advisor really was just someone who is pretty successful in business. And he was mm. someone who just bought some common sense and some you know reality to me helped me keep my feet on the ground and he'd say look that was a terrible race or that was pretty good or what was you doing there and you know he he would listen to my coach Tony and goodness knows what and he he was just that person I was really fortunate to have that was a good solid person and a good shoulder to to cry on if I needed to someone who could give me advice someone who would tell me if he felt I was saying something doing something mm -hmm. wrong just the advice that, you know, uh, anybody would, you know, would want from, from somebody. And that started from when I was, say, seven years old, and it never, ever changed all the way through my athletics career. So were you especially quick at seven? Um, I was very keen at seven. Um, I was OK. Um, one of the reasons I went down to an athletics club at the age of seven is because I loved running and jumping. Mm. And I actually thought my name was Will You Walk for about the first thing. Because <laughs> that's the most thing my mum and dad Brilliant. shouted at me. Yeah. Um, and I did a sports day at school. They got a local guy from the athletics club to come down and present the medals. And he spoke about it. And I said, can I go? And they said, yes. I tried all sorts of stuff. And it worked out that I was quite quick. Um, so I, I ditched all the long jump, triple jump, javelin, shot put, long distance races, stuck to the hundreds and two hundreds um, from the age of literally seven till 15. And then when I was 15, I ran my first 400 by accident because the guy who was supposed to run the 400 for our club didn't show up. And the team manager said, look, we need someone to run it. And my dad said, what have you got to lose besides another race? Give it a go. And I, I ran it, won it and broke the county record for my age group. And I like that feeling of winning. I went, yeah. That's my new event. Yeah, <laughs> just literally so, with it. a bit like a, a you know a gambler that that gets an early win and is hooked for life. I guess that's yeah. how it was for you and and sport. Kind of, but I, you know, if I lost the race, I wasn't losing money. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit <laughs> yeah. more of a positive addiction. A bit more of a positive addiction rather than a negative addiction. Exactly. And what about your personality? Were you naturally competitive as well? Very. Still am. If you ask my wife, I'm still very competitive. <laughs> Um, Monopoly, Trivial Pursuit. Oh, don't get me on Monopoly. So we've got four tennis. kids. <laughs> yeah, we've got four kids. And when we used to play Monopoly, I used to beat them all or go and, and my wife said, oh, you know, let them waste it. No, if they land on mine, I want my money. <laughs> little, little daughter would be crying. Give me your money. I don't care. Go and sit over there and cry. You're out. Right, the next day. Very competitive. Um, and I still am to this day. Yeah. And was there anything in your upbringing that, that also equipped you to be so successful? I mean, you know, were your parents disciplinarians or was there anything about your childhood that kind of possibly marked you out as someone that was going to oh, win things? Um, certainly from a discipline point of view, definitely my dad. You know, I was brought up by strict West Indian parents. Mm. Um, you know, my dad is a rags to riches kind of story, if you like. Um, what, what happened? Um, well, he, he, was, he came over to this country at the age of 15. From um, where? From Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Both my parents 
and said, uh, funny enough, they met in this country as opposed to meeting in Trinidad. Uh, and he came over here because, um, you know, his family thought he would seek a better life in this country. Um, and he sort of worked his way up to, you know, running and owning his own business and, uh, as I say, doing, you know, r relatively well. And, mm. and he instilled that kind of hard work uh, eth ethic onto, mm. onto me and my sister. But certainly through my athletics career, my dad gave me so much good advice. And if you, you know, if you ever uh, were to hear me on stage speak, you'll yeah. hear me talk about a lot about my dad, some of the things that, he, you know, he says. And I always describe my dad as the odour of my life. He wasn't green and hairy, but he was someone who was full of knowledge, information and, and wisdom, and he still is. Yeah, and what is the psychology of the winner? I mean, that's something that you've got medals to prove that you have. Um, but, but what would you say is the difference between somebody that gets on that podium and somebody that doesn't, doesn't quite make well, it? Well, you know what? I, I mean, it's a great question. It's a question I used to ask myself when I was competing and, and you'd go to a major competition and you'd, you know, the two, three, four days into the competition, you see people who've won gold. And I used to think, what's going through their mind? What makes him different? Because, from this because, because physically the level is very similar, right? It's pretty similar. And, you know, when it comes down to it, one of the things, uh, it might seem obvious now, but one of the things that I learned is you do all the training, all the hard work, everything leading up to a championships. But actually when you get there, Pretty much physically, there isn't much you can do. You're mm -hmm. in shape or you're not in shape. Yeah. Um, if you're not in shape, it's very difficult to get in shape. If you are in shape, it's easier to get out of shape because you can hurt yourself or, I don't know, get drunk or something stupid like yeah. that. So if it's not a physical thing, it's got to be a mental thing. And, and I very early on in my career learned that you need two things to be a champion. You've got to be physically in shape, which is the obvious one, but you also need to be mentally in shape. And they've both got to be working and firing on, on all cylinders. And when I say mentally in shape, I'm talking about, you know, being in the zone, having that confidence, knowing, having a game plan, um, having those people around you that are confident and also saying the right things to you. Um, being confident in yourself that when you turn up in a, in a, in a room um, with your other seven competitors where you're left maybe 40, 45 minutes before a race or in a tiny room, you know, that's the places where races are sometimes won and lost. Um, you know, we look at the situation that, you know, that Simone had and she very yeah. bravely came out and said, you know, mentally I'm not right. And there's been many a time, many sportsmen and women, uh, any lots of competition, not just Olympics, have gone out and performed Physically, they may be in shape, but mentally they're not. And it's not going to produce the results that you want. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, it's something that I kind of worked on just as much as the physical side was making sure that mentally I was prepared. And, you know, and I do things like lots of visualisation. And I know lots yeah. of people do it now, but I was doing lots of visualisation. You know, my sports psychologist gave me lots of things to help me put things into perspective, concentrate on things that I can control and not worry about the things that I can't control. Loads of different things. Yeah. Um, and I spent not days, hours or weeks, but years with the, you know, working on these, this, this process. And, re, you know, regardless to how I performed, the one thing that I was when I went to these championships was I knew I was mentally focused, in shape and ready to take on, you know, take on the world. Which is a fantastic set of tools uh, for your life of retirement. And now you're a motivational speaker and you help people in business and yeah. in all walks of life to achieve their best. Yeah. And, and what you, I guess, do is sort of share your experience and you share that psychology, that mentality yeah. of yeah. being a winner. I mean, how do you tackle certain key things and change, for example? There'll be people watching this and they yeah. think, I'm in a rut yeah. and I want a different life. You know, what, what do they do? I, I mean, there's lots of things I can do. I mean, in an overall thing, the one, one of the things that I do is, uh, I, you know, I have... Uh, stuff that I, I refer to in presentations of creating the mindset of an Olympian. Mm. Um, because people see Olympians as these superhuman beings that get it right on Do the we plane. have to buy the Lycra? Do we need uh, the You outfit? don't have to buy the Lycra, that's okay. a so nice no, thing. No dressing up. No, because I wouldn't even fit in my Lycra. It stretches, <laughs> but not that much. Um, but there's, you know, there's lots of things you can do, and change is a really important one at the moment, and mm. I have a thing called my you know, ADAPT theory, where you take the word ADAPT and it becomes an acronym, and very quickly, you know, the A stands for acceptance, accepting the new situation mm. you're in. The D stands for, right, now I've accepted whatever the situation is, am I still heading in the same direction? The next A stands for what alternatives are there for me. The P stands, once I've got all those alternatives, what's the new plan? And then the mm. T is to take that plan and transfer that into action. Um, so there's lots of different things. that, And I've been doing this all my athletics career. 
and in a roundabout way, not knowing that I don't. And what I've done is yeah. working with my coaches and psychologists and, and ex-training partners is put all that together in kind of packages so people can understand what we went through. And, you know, a great example is every Olympian was told in 2020, oh, by the way, games are cancelled for 12 months. We're going to do it next year. That's a huge change for everybody. It worked for some. It didn't work for others. Um, it was, a, uh, it was a, a blessing in disguise for some, and it wasn't for others. And a lot of people, or every Olympian, had to deal with it. And a bit like an injury or an unforced error or a referee's judgment, it's another test. It's another, and you've got no control of it. Deal with it. It's happening. Mm. And don't waste your time, effort and energy and it's been, about it's it. It's been cancelled, but it's been cancelled for everyone. And that's one of the things that I uh, said. I had a few uh, athletes say, oh, my God, what am I going to do? The Olympics has been postponed. I said, yeah, not not just for you, it's for everybody. And then they kind of say, oh, yeah, we're all in the same boat. And I say, no, you're not all in the same boat. We're all riding the same waves, but we're in different boats. If only 92 had been delayed by a year, you could have got your hammy better. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it wouldn't have pulled by then, yeah. But anyway, uh, it is and, what it and is. And where, where can people find out about what you do now as a, as a motivational speaker? Uh, easiest thing is to go onto my website, which is pretty simple, DerekRedman.com. Um, and that will be the easiest place to, uh, you know, to find me. Yeah, and it's a whole other career, and you're like Britain's Tony Robbins. It's quite remarkable <laughs> to watch not you. Tall. Not as tall, <laughs> not such a deep voice, similarly built. Um, some questions. Um, Derek um, asks Ed. Oh, sorry, forgive me. No, uh, I will get to the correct. It's Benny. Thank you, Benny, for your question. Benny asks, does Derek agree with Ed Warner, former chair of UK Athletics, that our athletics performance was grim this year? Uh, grim's quite a strong word. It wasn't great. Um, we had a few issues. We had a few problems. Um, we had some, you know, some, some injuries and some, you know, a couple of serious medal contenders, i.e. Dean Rasher-Smith and Catherine Johnson-Thompson. Mm. Um, it wasn't great. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be totally honest here. Um, there was, a, you know, a few events where we uh, we should have had some uh, some better results. Um, we came away, I think it was with six medals. Um, right. It was one medal better than I thought. I predicted five, uh, and and to me that was still not a great performance. But listen, the guys and girls of the world of athletics, they will know that wasn't a great. You know, mm. a great showing for us. We normally do, um, you know, contribute to the uh, overall medal tally with a, a, with a few more in, in the bag than that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it was great. Do we know what really... the problem was? I mean, is, well, there, a, is the there a change in approach to coaching? Uh, possibly there's a change in approach to coaching, um, the actual um, setting up. I mean, I'm not involved uh, now in, in UK athletics. Um, I'd love to have a chat with somebody there and see what I can help, you know, where I could get involved and, and help. Um, I personally think, and I don't know, but from what I can see, not all, but some of the attitude of the athletes is, uh, yeah. is you know, leaves a little bit to be, you know, to be desired. But it'd be, it'd be great to find out a bit more um, because there is better facilities now. There is better opportunities. There is the talent there, yet still we're still looking at some of the performances back in the, you know, mid to late 80s, 90s and then early noughties for some of our, you know, our best I, I do, I do need to get to the break, but I also don't want to miss a story that I'm sitting on. When you say attitude, what might be the issue there? Not wanting it enough? Not working hard enough? Arrogance? Uh, arrogance. Thinking really? that you've already made it when you, really? when you haven't. Yeah, that's one of the things that I hear a lot from coaches and, uh, and people that are involved in the sport. Yeah. And is that potentially within the culture of, of, of that discipline or could it just be a, a, a generational thing? Is it, uh, is it a good question. It could be a bit of both. Mm. It could be a bit of both. It could be you know, generation. It could be the discipline. I mean, I speak to ex-athletes who are now coaches who say they go down to the track and when they tell their athletes what they're doing, their athletes are barter with them. Well, instead of doing that, can I do this? No, this is the session. <laughs> Do it or, you know, or, or, or get out. Yeah. I never, ever bartered with my coach on training sessions. You were told what to do. You had the belief and faith in him. You got on and did it. And you have the uh, medals to show for it. <laughs> Derek, an absolute thrill to have you in the studio. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to profoundly disagree with you. You are an extraordinary national hero <laughs> of sport, of endurance. And I don't think you should be remembered, as you say, for that video, but for the many medals that adorn your mantelpiece. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.